Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. John the Baptist is a theological jackhammer, a word of God bulldozer, a great prophetic grading machine. The word of God, he proclaimed, broke up hard spiritual rock. It moved heaps of infertile soil out of the way. It leveled the road for the great deliverer, the king of kings, to ride in and begin to take his throne. He wore the uniform of the prophets to show that he wasn't just some ordinary guy. He was nourished by food that contrasted with the gluttony and selfishness that he was called to confront. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is as if to say, turn away from your ungodly rebellion, the dishonoring of his word. Turn away from your lukewarm or lack of worship, from your dishonoring of parents and other authorities from your anger and bitterness, from your lustful hearts, from your stealing, your gossip and your lies, from your scheming gluttony for things at the expense of justice and mercy. Turn away from these things. Confess them to God for the sins that they are and receive his forgiveness. For indeed the rule, the reign of God is come. And they came to hear him preach because they knew the truth in their hearts. And for a great many of them, their hearts were not so hardened that they were unwilling to hear the truth. But others, others with all the trappings of religion, had God given responsibility, but did indeed have hearts so hardened that they were not ready to receive the great deliverer. And so John took out the theological jackhammer that is the Word of God, and I paraphrase. You snakes, don't come to this baptism and say, I love the Lord. Do the things that show you know the truth that sets you free. Teach God's mercy for all people, as the prophet Isaiah says. Remember the deliverer to come from the line of Jesse, the king of righteousness, the seed of the woman, Stop teaching works righteousness and self-righteousness and teach God's righteousness. You Pharisees have built a theological business to maintain your own status when you know from the Scriptures that God promised to send the Messiah, the Savior, who would rule. Your time is up, but you don't want to give it up. Your godly ancestry is irrelevant if you reject the coming Messiah, and he is coming. And now the great jackhammer, the great bulldozer, the great leveling grader lays it down. We quote directly from Matthew 3. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And that was it. Either repent and believe in God's salvation in Jesus Christ and enter the kingdom of heaven, or reject God's salvation and be thrown into hell. And so far, for the Jews of the first century. But how about us? Of what do we in our day need to repent? And we'll speak this morning in two ways. Number one, in general, to American Christians, in general. And two, more specifically, to us at St. Paul's. American Christians are Americans. 
And there are many things that are wonderful about American culture and life. But there are certain aspects of our culture that are at odds with the way of God. One of these is a fundamental consumerism. And here's how that enters the church. We make Jesus a product to be sold. And we judge church success less by faithfulness to God's word and more by size and number of products and services offered. We're Americans. It's bigger. It's better. We treat the church like a theological business. If a church is not on the path to becoming a theological Walmart, we assume that it's obviously not doing something right. We borrow from common business terminology and say, if you're not growing, you're dying. Now, hear me clearly. That in itself is not heretical. But, and listen, listen clearly to how I say this. If the primary criteria for growth, if the primary criteria for growth is butts in the pews and money in the bank, then we're no different than the chief priests and the Pharisees of Jesus' time. In fact, we're worse because we know better. In the days of John the Baptist and of the prophets before him, there were lots of people coming to do their religious duty. They went to the temple for worship. They paid their tithes. They made the trip to Jerusalem for the Passover. If you judge spiritual health by temple offerings and number of attendees, everything was going great. But what did Jesus say when he entered the temple on Palm Sunday? He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. The American church, generally speaking, needs to repent of consumerism, be faithful to the word of God in worship and service, and let God provide the growth. It's not that numerical growth is unimportant. Of course it's important. Go and make disciples of all nations. It's that if you listen to the preaching of John the Baptist and of Jesus and of the apostles, it is faithfulness to the Word of God that is of first importance. What does Jesus say? Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all this other stuff will be added to you. And that brings us then specifically to the pastors and the people of St. Paul's. Our namesake, St. Paul, writes in Romans 15, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, From infancy you have known the Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to repent of biblical naivete. If there's going to be faithful growth here, it will only be because the members of this congregation are learning to faithfully read, understand, and apply the Bible. And that starts with me. I've spent a lot of time in the last few months working on memorizing the gospel according to St. Matthew. 
And that has been a glorious thing. It's been probably going to prove to be the most difficult intellectual thing that I have ever attempted. And it's an amazing thing to memorize Scripture. You start to see connections that casual reading cannot notice. But when I became a pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, I took vows to be diligent in study of the Scriptures and the Lutheran Confessions. And as I thought about our biblical naivete as a whole, as a congregation, I had to confess my own personally. For while I have spent a lot of time in the last few months in St. Matthew, I have not spent much time in the Psalms or the Old Testament, which, the Apostle says, are written for our instruction. One of the consequences for me of focusing too narrowly is that I allowed myself to be surprised by some of the things that happened among the people of God here. And sometimes that led to unrighteous anger, which, as we all know, is not the Lord's desire. I repent. And now let's talk about some other issues in the congregation as a whole. If you bring your child to baptism, but then don't raise them in the faith, if you do not learn the story of salvation, the Bible, in your home, and practice confession and forgiveness in your home, you need to repent. If you tell your children that they have to go to school, but then tell them that they have the option to go to church or not, that is utterly, biblically naive. And you need to repent. If we dared to actually read the Scriptures, if many of us were not so biblically naive, we would not bureaucratize our parenting we would know that it is primarily the parents' vocation to teach the children the faith. We would know that men are to be heads of households in complementary partnership with their wives and that together they are to lead their children. Regular time in the Scriptures, being instructed by the narratives of the Old and New Testaments, not just select verses now and then, but the stories themselves would impress upon parents the necessity of faithful discipleship in the home. Now children, most of you are not innocent here. Perhaps your father, even if he grew up going to church, never experienced the sort of family discipleship of which the scriptures speak. And so when he tries, you snicker at him and laugh at him and mock him. And in so doing, you are dishonoring your father, which is a sin against God. And you need to repent. Children, if you manipulate your parents, for example, one parent who wants to go to church and the other parent who doesn't, if you manipulate them into the easy way of not going or of just showing up and being passive, if you deliberately make life difficult for them in worship, you need to repent. Biblical naivete has sig significant impacts on all aspects of our life, including worship. Singing, for example. Biblically naive people don't know biblical theological language, which means that if they have any devotional life at all, it tends toward the simple, lowest common, denom lowest common denominator type of stuff that is quick and easy. Now again, hear me clearly and hear me with the love with, this, with which this is intended. Quick and easy is a fine place to start, and truthfully, maybe the necessary place to start.
But God calls us to mature in Christ, to grow up into Him, Ephesians 4. We are called to move, Hebrews 5, 1 Corinthians 3, we're called to move from spiritual milk to meat. If your biblical diet in devotion and music, well into adulthood even, is quick and easy, well, that's like fast food. And that's fine now and then. But if that's your regular diet, what you're doing is you're starving your soul of the necessary nutrients for biblical growth. You are stunting your growth. We all, we all have some repenting to do. The good news, friends, right, is that John the Baptist proclaimed that too. John didn't just go out in the wilderness with brimstone and leave people wallowing in their sins. He proclaimed that the Messiah was coming and John, grace upon grace, after all those centuries of prophets, John actually got to see him and baptize him. And he got to point at him and say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, friends, God kept his promise. In the fullness of time, for our foolishness, he took it upon himself. The apostle says, for our sake, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin, that in him, in Jesus, we might become, we might have the righteousness of God. Jesus even took the punishment of death upon himself so that he might deliver us from death to life. And that's not just about heaven to come. It's also about right now. We who have much to repent of, God has gathered here today to deliver to us his forgiveness. For the one who came in the body and promises to come again in the body still comes right here right now, to deliver to us, to deliver to you the forgiveness that changes everything. The apostle says, Philippians 3, forget what lies behind and strain forward then towards what is ahead. You may have spent decades not doing this right, and the Lord says, I forgive you. Forget what, be, what is behind and strain forward to what is ahead, toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, let those of us who are mature think in this way. Our hope thus, friends, is not in ourselves and in our own efforts. Our hope is in Christ. He is the great deliverer who gives us true hope. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word.